now invite everyone for the last session of the last uh, day which is on endophthalmitis uh, if i can have the vice council up here with me uh, dr skim ramasamy dr prashant agnihotri dr tara prasad das dr chetan rao dr anand pangarkar and uh, dr jayant guha So we'll be having uh, four interesting talks on uh, anywhere here or there. We'll be having four interesting talks on different aspects of uh, endophthalmitis. We'll be starting off uh, with we'll be starting off with Dr. Avinash Patange. Right, so Dr. Avinash Patange, I think none of the people here require any introduction. Dr. Avinash Patange will be giving our keynote on uh, fungal endophthalmitis. How is it different? Over to you, Dr. Patange. Thank you, Vivek. And fungal endophthalmitis, I have just made it simplified because it's going to be a last day, last session of year, not very much taxing. And most of my, uh, most of the slides, what I have, uh, it's just converted into question and answer format from the 12 publications what we have, which have significant amount of data on fungal endophthalmitis as well. So 12 questions which would be answered here. And now looking into the landscape of fungal endophthalmitis, we all like to start with understanding the numbers. So what would be the incidence of fungal endophthalmitis in Indian subcontinent? And uh, let me also uh, give this, uh, that most of the data are from the Indian subcontinent, not from the West. So we have both exogenous and endogenous. And in endogenous, is more than the uh, exogenous in terms of incidence of fungal endophthalmitis. Just for ease of remembering, it's around 12 to 15 percent is what you can remember. And in exogenous, uh, in acute post-operative and post-trauma or post-open globe associated, it's somewhere between 8 to 10 percent. And a major chunk of uh, fungal endophthalmitis, what we get to see here, is it's delayed post-operative because it's nearly about uh, 33 percent. So two common fungus uh, we get to see in different clinical scenario. Uh, both, uh, both happens to be uh, aspergillus and candida. And these are two common fungus. In exogenous fungus endophthalmitis, what are the challenges? Unlike patients with microbial keratitis, uh, in endophthalmitis, it's very hard to make a clinical diagnosis based on, on clinical observations. So can we make a diagnosis of possible fungal etiology when the patient presents with in acute post-operative endophthalmitis? Unlikely. So is that possible in delayed post-operative? Because in the, in the context of 33% of the cases, what we get to see here in India happens to be fungus. Can we make? So now here's where I would like to answer it in a, in a different way. I'll just take a D route and then come back. So we all understand that post-capsular basification or PC plug is synonymous with key acnes, but it's it's not so. It's not patognomonic of key acnes, but can be seen in many other organisms as well. So uh, enough to say that there are some of fungus which can be associated with a plug in the posterior capsule, it's just not key acnes. So if you have to answer the question that if there is a possibility to identify fungal endophthalmitis on clinical observations on presentation, the answer is no get. Now what about trauma? The clinical suspicion just increases if there is a when on, you get to see a fungal ball or if the patient presents with a history of uh, history of vegetable injury with vegetable matter. But the caveat always also remains that in post trauma cases, cases there is a possibility in small percentage of patients polymicrobial infections where fungus can coexist with bacteria as well. Now the other end of the spectrum where though rarity but can pose a significant challenge challenge to the extent that many of these cases need evisceration if not appropriately treated is fungal endophthalmitis which is sorry endophthalmitis which is associated with microbial keratitis and that's where we taste a lot of success for the only reason that the culture positivity in microbial keratitis from the scraping from the cornea from a colleagues from the cornea services 
help us to diagnose fungus endothelitis much quicker than bacterial endothelitis and helps in earlier treatment. Now, in endogenous, can we make a diagnosis of possible fungal etiology? Unlike exogenous, it's very challenging. But in endogenous, there is a possibility. The two most commonest organisms, what I just mentioned, Aspergillus and Candida, both have a pattern. Understanding the pattern is important for us to identify what is the possible cause. If it is focal cause, it's a focal lesion, posterior focal lesion, somewhere in the retina or underneath the retina and starts budding very slowly. You are looking at the candida. But if there is an aspergillus which has a tendency to be underneath the macula and present with dense vitritis and grow as aggressive as bacteria. The key point is aspergillus will grow as aggressive as bacteria. If, if you see something similar to that, then the possibility of one to make a diagnosis of aspergillus should be kept high in mind. Now, having said that, there is one more clinical sign which all of us keep talking about rain cloud sign. If it is there, you make a, it makes diagnosis of candida a little bit easier, but it is not a must that one has to see a rain cloud. Without rain clouds also, one can make a diagnosis. Now, having said that, so what are the various antifungals which are available in the management? Is the age-old treatment of amphotericin still good enough? or it poses a challenge to oriconazole. Now, for this, one has to understand the pharmacokinetics. Now, let me downsize oriconazole because it is being thought the drug which can help in management of all cases of fungus. Fairly good enough to, as a beginner to have a debate, but if you understand the pharmacokinetics, this is very similar to fluoroquinolones, where it has a very, very short half-life. Too much so forth in vitretomycide is just about two and a half hours. So if one has to sustain a concentration of oriconazole into the eye, it has to be injected even twice a day for it to have an efficacious action. So the, so the age-old drug amphotericin still holds good in the management of fungal endothelitis, and it has a duration of 7 to 14 days in non metatomized eye in, when 5 microgram is injected into the eye. And sometimes there is a possibility that if, when someone has injected 5 and 5 microgram in a metatomized eye, and you have to sustain the concentration for a prolonged period of time. So every third day, you can still inject 2.5 micrograms to have a sustained level of concentration of amphotericin. And the reason why I want to talk about sustained level of concentration will be answered next. Now, this is the question which would help, and I would like to connect a sustained level of concentration. So unlike bacterial endothelitis, where one injection is sufficient in most of the cases, just like in coagulous negative stuff, it is not the case in fungus. So, because these drugs are static, and then it takes a longer time for these organisms to have a killing concentration into the eye, where you have to sustain the concentration. And that's the reason why sometimes you will have to inject many injections. There, there are cases where sometimes patients have to be injected 10 or 15 or even 20 times inside the eye whenever it's possible to salvage. And how do we do it? It's not that every five days we call and re-inject the same concentration because it can be toxic. So uh, every three days, inject half the dose and sustain the concentration for a prolonged period of time. So this is one paper which we had presented where a patient received multiple injections in a cluster, and most of the patients we were not able to salvage the eye, but also able to give back a decent amount of vision or favorable vision. Now, next debatable topic always in endothelial matrix is vitrectomy versus staph. And I think there is not much of debate which can be done in fungus endothelitis. We cannot extrapolate what has been proposed in EVS in these cases because EVS did not study fungus endothelitis. And two of our publications uh, and have already shown that early vitrectomy and complete vitrectomy favors uh, also good favorable outcomes in patients with fungal endothelitis. Now, something which if you are not able to salvage the eye with injection, you are not happy with vitrectomy, can silicon oil help in fungal endothelitis? Uh, it can, in in vivo study what we have found, in vitro study what we have found, it helps more in bacterial, but in fungus, in, in vitro, it we found that they continue to persist. And this is one such example where, uh, it's a proof of concept where the patient presents with focal endogenous endothelitis, Vitrectomy, poor intraocular antibiotics does not help. People want to think about silicon oil. You can see even after injection of silicon oil in the third photograph, there's a progression of lesion underneath the silicon oil. So silicon oil may be helpful in certain cases of bacterial, but fungi may not be very helpful. So that brings me to a penultimate question: How do we manage recalcitrant cases? Right. So Abhinash, not doing you, well in intraocular antibiotics. Can you summarize it a little yes. quickly? 
and then with multiple injections uh, recalcitrant cases we have we have published about the possibility of using a cryo to manage this infections and reduce the inflammation recurrent inflammation and on the next frontiers which we can is move from oriconazole to fosconazole and we had a good amount of success in 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 patients when they presented during covid pandemic and and also usage of intravitreal castrofungins again uh, with a concentration around 50 to 100 microgram can be considered in these settings so these are my references and i thank uh, vrsf for giving me this opportunity thank you avinash thank you for that comprehensive talk on fungal endophthalmitis the message is clear with respect to the pattern of presentation in fungal endophthalmitis the role of cryo in recalcitrant cases and uh, the subset where uh, silicon oil uh, may be useful i now call upon uh, dr tara prasad das uh, to give his talk uh, his talk will be uh, on uh, antibiotics uh, that we use in endophthalmitis and uh, over to you dr das to Vivek? start off your talk can somebody put Thank up his you. slides please Vivek? he's not there it is here though. no for uh, uh, this talk i think you're a little short on time so we will see if we can take those questions uh, at the end Thank you. Uh, in none of my days, uh, understanding that this is a colonization of, of uh, bugs inside the eye, we have antimicrobials, antimicrobials just not antibiotic, it also antifungals, and, and uh, Vinas has spoken very nicely about the antifungals. Look at the historically speaking, um, five decades ago, started with the Golam payment, and then between these five decades, a lot of things have changed, so we have changed from one antibiotic to two antibiotics, and I'm changing antibiotic from medication to cephalidine, cephalidine to infomycin. And today, because you are um, efficient microbiology services in the world, most probably will always think about a cultural susceptible organism as an antibiotic, at least one who will repeat antibiotics half of the time repeat. Now, these three important drugs, which I started my residence with, these three drugs, minimizing and mutation, both, both of them aminoglycosides, good for gram negative bacilli. And one supervision which I start with to treat patients where first generation cephalus were in good for gram positive oxide. And why do we change it? We change because um, both uh, all lebanon glycosides are maculite toxic. There is a picture uh, taken from Avinash. And then uh, the cephalurins are not necessarily methicin resistant, or is sensitive, so we have to change the drug. When we change, we change to, uh, by the EVS recommendation, we change to vancomycin and septagidine, and uh, this is how to, we talked in the last talk also. Incidentally, those who are still ignorant that uh, EVS did not test amicacin, sorry, vancomycin at all. They only tested amicacin because by that time, there are a lot of publications between 1995 about the toxicity by melanoglycoside, glycoside, particularly amicacin, to change to septagidine. Now, vancomycin is, is a glyco, glycoprotein antibiotic and good for, uh, for GPC and gram positive cocci, including resistance type aureus. And septagenine works on the cell, cell, cell synthesis, cell walls of the bugs, and good for uh, most of the gram negative bacilli. Now, how do you determine the, what antibiotic is used? You know, there's so many antibiotics available. One, how do you use your spectrum of infection in your locality? to the antimicrobial property and their drug elimination like Avinash talks just mentioned, and susceptibility res resistance pattern. These were publication from US, EVS, and ESCRS Europe. That the gram-negative bacilli was hardly there, 6% EVS and none in ESCRS, and, and then, uh, and uh, when you look at the data, compare the data in India and Asia, we find that a substantial amount of gram-negative bacilli and some amount of around 15, 17 percent of, of fungi. In that scenario, we just, just cannot copy paste what happened somewhere else, but it find out your solution, and drugs will not change. Only you have to find, think again how to do it. We also published a 25-year data by Lutasa that we found that increasingly there are a lot of uh, culture negative, they're not really, they're not, 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 not necessarily not infective, but culture negative antifemitis. And we also found that, uh, as we talked about that, look at the half-life of the drug that we're injecting inside the eye, and Avinas has spoken very lightly. And the two of the drug examples, ciprofloxacin, mocrofloxacin, so short half-life, even though they're good drugs, you have to repeat so often that you cannot actually inject it. Same thing applies to Vodiconazole also. This is all about the, anti or the fungi, antifungals. But two new antifungals, which one should consider, are, are the castrofungin and prosaconazole, 
that might be useful in a, in a, in a, at least in a country like India and, and Asia. And they, 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 what you talk about the elimination of the six ways you can drugs and eliminate and some are anterior, some are posterior, some are combined. And we also published that over 25 years in our LV Prasad system, uh, vancomycin resistance has gone up to 7%, but septagen up to 62%. So think again what you're going to inject for your eyes to, to save a patient. We also look at the patient referred to us and not referred to uh, in-house uh, in, uh, in anathematics. We found that not big difference. But in either case, uh, if you look at this particular one, septagenine is still uh, not more than uh, 50 or 60 percent uh, in, uh, in, in either referred or not referred. I just last, uh, my last talk I was giving about this uh, currently ongoing EMS and management study. You found that gemcomycin is still good, but for gram negative, imitanim, septagenine are similar, and then cholesterol is marginal, not quite marginal, it is way ahead of uh, the curve. And all those who are collision resistant are incidentally also any penum sensitive. So then the last question is that, which uh, was asked to me, how do, what is your first choice of antibiotic? If you do not have a proper microbiology facility, because evidence is not generated enough, go by evidence, evidence is that inject vancomycin septagidine. If required to repeat by, by your clinical schedule, please repeat the same drug, because nothing else is available to you. Till we publish our data, final data comes. We only publish interim data, right? But in case you have a good microbiology facility, many hospitals in India will have it, then consider either imipenim or, or cholestin in that instead of septagenine because you have the data available to you over the last several uh, hundreds of patients. And in case you repeat it, then go by your cultural susceptibility test and instead of going empiric treatment. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Das, uh, for finishing in on time and lucidly explaining how the spectrum of organisms are changing and how our susceptibilities are changing. Uh, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Chetan Rao, uh, what in your practice is your uh, current empiric approach and are there specific clinical situations where you divert from them and upfront use something else without waiting for a culture sensitivity? The post-operative endophthalmitis, we know there are very specific organisms. There we are very clear about it. So we take a tap and then we inject the uh, little injections. And of course, depending on whether the media is extremely poor, the cornea is hazy, we go ahead with the tectomy if that is necessary. We go according to what the general uh, <clears throat> what <you> call <clears throat> rule of thumb is for endophthalmitis treatment. But if it comes to trauma, that's when we don't follow any rule. We go by a uh, the assumption that it's a polymicrobial uh, thing, take a tap, but whatever uh, uh, tissue that is available to us, it could be iris tissue, it could be lens, capsule, vitreous, anything, and send it and treat it as a uh, polymicrobial tissue. So we can have a cover, cover for the gram negative bacilli, cover for uh, fungus, and treat accordingly, and assess the situation every 24 hours, and those patients are definitely need admission and a 24 hour surveillance. So your upfront empiric is still vancocepta yeah, in the still vancocepta, right? Uh, Doctor Goa, you want to make a point? So uh, yeah, I agree with Jaitan what he said, but uh, I just want to emphasize here the point of that the vitreous biopsy, vitreous biopsy of an undiluted initial part when you fix it to a 10 ml syringe and make few cuts or 800 cuts and the sample that you take it that has the highest yield, vitreous biopsy. Number one, rather than a tap. And second is that uh, when it comes to vitrectomy, I would also like to have the panel's view. The seniors are here, Dr. Das is here. How radical, in case you want to do a radical vitrectomy, how radical should be the approach? Because I understand that uh, SIR's study includes radical vitrectomy up to the equator and not. So, so how radical that should be? I think. Uh, I think uh, Nowadays, that is the standard of care. We go for radical as much as we can because now no more is like core and all. Point I was trying to make that uh, because sir uh, would also a... like to elaborate that we uh, uh, you have yeah to... today we do vitrectomy much better, much larger much better instrument for vitrectomy is registered in by EVS because uh, yeah. at that time vitrectomy was not so refined, so technologically advanced. True, we today. can really really do good job. Yes, there's a question coming. Would would the bacterial versus fungal endophthalmitis? Would there be a difference in the approach in vitrectomy? Well, definitely. Obviously, we have published and we know that vitrectomy is always preferred treatment, uh, and preferred first treatment for, for fungal endophthalmitis. 
question is how do you suspect it? If you are seeing anthomide in, in, a, in a week or two weeks time, then in viral it will be bacterial. And a little longer while, more than six weeks, maybe fungal, but the in between can happen. But you have to have a urine character diagnosis, clinically diagnosing fungal or bacterial infection. But certainly, if fungal, vitrectomy is also. Yeah. Dr. Stewart, you want to make a point? Yeah, I think uh, Michael, your mic is okay. Now better. Now better. I think the mic is still not working for you. <laughs> Thank you. So, oh, as you know, over the last 15 years, very steady shift of cataract surgeons routinely using intracameral antibiotics for prophylaxis of endophthalmitis after uncomplicated surgeries. In Europe, much of that ceftazidime. In the US, it's moxifloxacin, vancomycin, ceftazidime. What is your view on that strategy? Uh, with this country, after learning from the ESCRA ceftriaxime intracameral, uh, there's one elegant study came from Arvind where they say the moxifloxacin is equally good, if not better. We did a comparative study, we published already that ceftriaxime and moxifloxacin both are similar. We also found that because you have a more of gram-negative infection or a sizable chunk of gram-negative infection, 25-27%, we thought that moxifloxacin might be better than ceftriaxime for our setting, it's not generic. And two, by cost-wise, moxifloxacin is available ready to use instead of getting a powder, mixing it. So from cost-effectiveness-wise, moxy is better, and at least one lab, or a lab produces it. We did a survey also published that uh, when, I think three years ago, uh, 63 or 65 percent of the Indian ophthalmology practicing cataract surgeons are using moxifloxacin. But if I do a survey today, most, I mean, intracameral, if I just do today, maybe 90 percent, 95 percent are using moxifloxacin. Questions is the supposing is the incidence of anathematics reduced because of intracameral antibiotics? Answer is yes. But then still you see and what you see. And then today when I see patient, like, that's what the question last time asked that for our referral practice in, in LB Prasad Hyderabad campus, we have got more of gram negative than gram positive because most probably they're not referred to. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Prasad. We have a next talk coming up. Uh, Dr. Vivek Dave is going to talk to us on total vitrectomy versus co-vitrectomy pro and con. Uh, let's stick to the time and... Uh... Yeah, thank you. Can I have my slides, please? Thank you. So, I'll be talking to you on uh, a topic that was just alluded to, total vitrectomy versus uh, core vitrectomy, pros and cons, and uh, some of uh, my views as to how I uh, look at it. So this, yes, does seem to be a long-standing controversy. If you have a group of surgeons, you might have uh, different opinions that different surgeons have with respect to how much vitreous uh, they are likely to clear. So if you look at uh, the what, what the terms mean, if this uh, red shade is uh, the actual vitreous, core vitrectomy would be something you know limited right in the center, whereas uh, a complete vitrectomy would be clearing out the vitreous after inducing a posterior vitreous detachment uh, to the extent possible. Now, a core vitrectomy uh, to begin with would have certain straightforward advantages. There's a central debulking of uh, the vitreous. It is easy and quick. The posterior hyaloid is uh, not touched here, so PVD induction related risks of causing complications are not there. Uh, it assists us in having uh, adequate uh, microbiologic sample collection for our microbiologic evaluation. Make some space for injecting the antibiotics and because you are removing some vitreous, you are removing uh, inflammatory debris and organisms uh, with it, you are debulking the infectious load to an extent. But are we doing enough? Now, uh, this was the paper that Dr. Das also alluded to. Uh, what we saw in this paper, which was our 10-year data uh, comprising of 9,000 plus samples, uh, was that around 35% cases were culture positive. So that leaves us with 70% cases, 65% cases where we really don't know what the organism is. 20% uh, were fungi. Avinash alluded to the fact that the fungus is difficult to treat. And over 60% were resistant to ceftazidime, which is our first line empiric therapy in most setups. So when you look at this overall picture, where in a lot of cases you don't know what is the organism, uh, your uh, empiric drug is often resistant. And the fact that you are dealing with uh, 
notorious organism like fungus usually uh, you know around in one in five cases so would just removing a limited vitreous be adequate so those are the thoughts EVS uh, we are all aware of uh, certain clauses of the surgical protocol in EVS the vitrectomy there was a core vitrectomy they did not do an extensive vitrectomy PVD induction was discouraged for the fear of inducing breaks and the primary goal was largely to obtain a specimen for culture and make space for antibiotics uh, the protocol did not really allow extensive clearance from over the macula and an important caveat in the EVS is uh, maculopathy accounted for 50% uh, of cases where the final vision was less than 20 by 40. So is it possible that removing the posterior hyaloid in those cases and clearing of the macula of the infectious debris could have helped? So that's a point of conjecture. The repeat procedures in EVS. So this paper deals with repeat procedures there. As we know, they had a, uh, a group of TAP and a group of this limited vitrectomy. So instead of core and a, a radical vitrectomy, you look at TAP and a, a sort of a, a limited vitrectomy. You will see here that in the EVS, the procedure which was less of an intervention had a greater reprocedure rate. So if you take that same analogy, it is quite possible that if you just do a limited vitrectomy, you might end up having to re-intervene your patients repeatedly. So why did they restrict to limited vitrectomy in those days? Uh, one big point could be the armamentarium that was available at that time. Right now, we have better visualization, better instruments, and a lesser risk of inducing hydrogenic trauma. Again, uh, taking an analogy from systemic medicine, we know endophthalmitis is inflammation of the inner coats of the eye with exudation in the vitreous cavity. Take an analogy of a skin abscess. So if you have a skin abscess, which is again a confined pocket of pus, very analogous to an endophthalmitis, what do we really do there? We know from surgery that you clear out all that abscess to ensure that it heals well. So taking that same analogy, it you know sort of strikes to us that if you have good visualization and surgical armamentarium, it is often prudent to remove the entire vitreous as far as possible. If you look at current literature now, there is ample evidence in literature in the last four or five years which tells us that removing the vitreous to the extent possible is a much better option than possibly just injecting antibiotics or doing a limited vitrectomy. Our in-house experience with respect to different organisms in our sub-analysis has also shown that wherever we have done a complete vitrectomy, the final outcome in similar clinical presentations has been the same. So I think a complete vitrectomy scores over a limited core vitrectomy because it has a better infection clearance, greater capacity to do, deload the vitreous cavity, importantly an opportunity to assess the retinal surface on table so that you know what is the prognosis likely to be and potentially decreases the VR interface sequelae. Uh, Dr. Girdar is going to talk on those sequelae. So once the endophthalmitis resolves, you are less likely to have these sequelae and a greater ability of the clinician to discuss the prognosis uh, with the patient. So in uh, totality, my current approach here is a vitreous tap or a biopsy only if it's a very early clinical presentation or there are equivocal clinical findings. PPV with a PVD induction almost in all cases of clinical endophthalmitis and an endoscopy or a K-pro assisted surgery if the endophthalmitis has a very poor corneal visibility and a core PPV right now in my practice, I hardly ever follow. So thank you so much uh, for attention. Thank you, and thank you so much, Dr. Vivek. Uh, uh, for an extensive coverage and I think the carry home message is yes you should remove as much vitreous as possible. Now I'll call upon Dr. Girdar to come and uh, give his uh, talk on managing complications post endophthalmitis after the storm. And we can take questions uh, once we have time later. Thank you Prashant. After those uh, three very good talks by from LVP and I really appreciate for the pioneering work they have done in endophthalmitis. My topic is, when I was given this topic, I was just wondering, well, how should I prepare for this talk? So I picked up four cases from our EMR data, four patients with poor outcomes. And I'm just running through these four cases. And since we have a panel of experts, probably they can say what went wrong, whether anything could have been done better. This is the case number one. This is a 55-year-old male who underwent an uncomplicated cataract ex surgery. He had a visual acuity. The surgery was done in our institution. On the eighth day after surgery, she, the patient had a visual acuity of 6 by 9. However, two weeks later, the patient came to the emergency with a history of soap water exposure in the eye, and he rubbed the eye, and the patient came with pain, redness, visual acuity was 6 by 18. 
There was no hypopion, but there was inflammation. And the emergency doctor consulted with a consultant, and they thought with the history that the patient gave, it could be an inflammation. However, they were good enough to call the patient next day morning, but within 12 hours, the visual acuity had reduced to counting fingers one meter with a hypopion, and you can see the photograph there. So conventional treatment, standard of care was approached with AC tab, intravitreal vancomycin, and also for uh, sample for gram stain, KOH, PCR, and topical fortified drops, topical antibiotics, along with systemic antibiotics were started. There was a slight worsening of the corn. The, the, actually, the, the, the wound, the entry wound, actually was the one that was infected with significant hypopion corneal edema. There were, there were a few echoes in the vitreous cavity, too. There was slight improvement, but uh, there, and the culture showed Staphylococcus aureus, and a repeat dose was done along with a glue contact lens. Patient improved significantly, was stable, and, the, and <coughs> subsequently the PCR showed a panfungal inhibit, and antifungal also was added to the treatment, and, and, and also the patient underwent subsequently, and even though there was a clinical improvement, the patient underwent, a, there was a thick membrane, probably a fibrous in growth from that particular corneal wound, for which initially intracamelar avastin was given to reduce the uh, vascularity, and subsequently a patch graft and membranectomy was done and subsequently the patient improved significantly to a visual acuity of 6 by 24. You can see the photograph here. However, there was a recurrence of the membrane in the in the pupillary area, probably a fibrous ingrowth and the visual acuity slowly reduced to 3 by 60 when the patient was last examined very recently. Patient has been given an option of penetrating keratoplasty with removal of this fibrous ingrowth completely. Vitreous cavity reasonably clear, fundus is still seen, there was no need for any vitrectomy. This is case number one. So the complications and challenges, recurrent membrane formation, fibrous growth from the membrane wound, and possibly a PK with complete removal of the membrane and ingrowth. This is case number one. Case number two, treated by me, a referred patient to me way back in 2017, cataract surgery done, uncomplicated. The patient was referred to me as a slightly delayed endophthalmitis, but when I took a detailed history, it was, history was very clear that the patient has been maintained on topical steroids, and the moment the steroid is reduced, there is significant inflammation. Therefore, this is basically a subacute endophthalmitis and a delayed diagnosis of a subacute endophthalmitis. Proper treatment standard of care was initially offered to him, and since there was, it was a coagulase negative Staphylococcus aureus, and since there was no improvement, patient underwent a complete vitrectomy, including PVD induction and also intravitreal injection. And the second dose, I gave some dexamethasone also intravitreally because fungus a pans PCR for fungal genome at that point of time was negative. The patient improved significantly to 6 by 60. He came with recurrent uh, choroidal detachment and retinal detachment, and I finally did a vitrectomy, siliconal injection. Unfortunately, the patient had a bad outcome, and probably whether we could have managed better, whether silicon oil injection should have been done in the initial sitting itself, or whether the chronicity of the disease was responsible. Do I have time? Okay. So this is case number three. This is a post-DALC endophthalmitis, the graph showed Klebsiella pneumonia. The patient again was managed with the therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty and intravitreal cholestin based on culture reports. The patient improved significantly, but the problem now is significant hypotony. There is no evidence of any retinal detachment or choroidal detachment. Visual acuity is hand movements. He is on diflu bread. Eye drops six times a day. Possibility of intra Vitreal triamcinol has been offered to the patient, but the patient has not had the treatment asset. So should I stop you? There is time actually. Okay, this is the last case. This is a post vitrectomy endophthalmitis by one of my senior vitreoretinal surgeons in our group. This patient had a macular hole surgery, came back with significant eye pain, and usually post vitrectomy endophthalmitis are usually fulminant. And you can see here the patient underwent an immediate vitreous lavage and intravitreal antibiotics along with voriconazole. And also, subsequently, since it was fulminant, piperacillin and tazobactam combination was given. And she had multiple doses of the same, but unfortunately, the outcome was bad. Patient was lost for a recent follow-up. And finally, patient ended with a PL negative thysis by Therefore, this patient had a very fulminant endophthalmitis with bad sequelae. These are the four cases. 
I thought this may be a better way to discuss some of the complications of endophthalmitis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Giridhar, for uh, bringing in those scenarios. Often when we start treating endophthalmitis, we feel it's straightforward. There is a protocol and the protocol vanishes once the patients are in follow-up with sort of every patient taking yeah. their own course. Uh, uh, Dr. Kim, if I can if uh, I come to you. one sentence because yeah, sure. I thought that, you know, I, my last slide went out. You need to manage your patient also. So that is the biggest Absolutely. challenge in this situation. So I have only a few take-home messages. In my hospital, I tell them the same dedicated team should manage. Each visit different doctor sees, you will get the notice very fast. You have to show that, that you are doing your best. Medical records should be complete with day-to-day -day entry. When I prepared this talk, I found one of the cases, the entry was very bad. I actually took very, I was very upset with the team. So these are very important. They don't shun away responsibility. And the same team should treat. That is very important. Day one, day two, day three, different, different doctors see, give different, different information. It leads to confusion. I think excellent points, Dr. Gidhar, cannot be overemphasized about the same people and showing that intent that you are, you know, uh, giving your best. Uh, Dr. Kim, in uh, cases where post endophthalmitis management, if you start seeing a retinal detachment in the uh, follow-up period, and often say uh, there is a skirt of vitreous that is left behind in the periphery, which is pretty common sometimes because visualization may not be clear. While tackling that retinal detachment, uh, do you have an approach which is any, which is any different from uh, a rigmatogenous detachment with respect to usage of a band and or peripheral laser or do you approach uh, in a similar manner? So I, usually it's a complete vitrectomy. I would do it exactly how I would do a, a rigmatogenous retinal detachment, a routine detachment, do a complete peripheral base removal, ensuring that you remove any material that may be left over. So there's, there won't be any difference. I would use laser in these cases, provided the retina in that area is not, uh, you know, pale and infected. So it won't be any different. I would use silicon oil in these cases. Yeah, so the inclination would be towards silicon oil with respect to our yeah. tamponade. So I think we have a couple of questions too. I think what we will do is uh, we will take the last talk, which is a paper presentation. And once it's over, uh, we will take all the questions together in whatever uh, allocated time we have remaining. So if I can call upon uh, Dr. Akash Belange. Uh, Dr. Akash is from uh, the LV Prasad Eye Institute, Hyderabad campus. And he'll be presenting his uh, free paper on an inflammatory score to prognosticate uh, post-cataract surgery endophthalmitis. Over to you, Akash. A very good morning. So, coming to my topic, that is inflammatory score could be a good prognosticator in post-cataract surgery and of thalmitis. So, the main principle behind management of end of thalmitis is clinical examination, microbiology, intravitreal antibiotics, and vitrectomy. So, in clinical examination, basically we uh, suspect an infection or whether it's just an inflammation. In microbiology, we confirm the inf infection. And uh, by giving intravital antibiotics, we treat the infection. And by doing vitrectomy, we treat the infection and also remove the inflammatory debris. So, infection and inflammation are very important in endophthalmitis. So, infection can be quantified and quali uh, you know uh, qualified by culture and various microbiology techniques. Whereas, inflammation must be an in integral part and has to be quantified. So. Uh, uh, das et al. and uh, Dave et al. had come up with a very novel inflammatory score criteria based on which uh, the inflammation was graded and quantified by four cardinal tissues that is cornea, anterior chamber, iris and vitreous. So when the inflammation uh, score is less than 10, the patients were subjected for a vitreous tap along with intravitreal antibiotic injection whereas when the inflammatory score was more than 10, they were subjected for vitrectomy along with intravital antibiotic injection. And both these groups were randomized into group A and group B, where group A received vancomycin, septamidizidim, and dexamethasone, and group B receiving vancomycin, imipenim, and dexamethasone. So what we found out was when the inflammation score was higher, these patients presented much earlier uh, with symptoms and much earlier presentation to the clinic. They presented with a very much poorer visual acuity. Here we can see when the inflammatory score is more than 20, 
all the patient presented with hand movements and we found out that the culture was positive in 38% of the uh, patients in this prospective study but when we included the newer uh, molecular techniques like PCR and uh, NGS what we found out the microbiology positivity almost doubled from 38% to nearly 67% and we found out that the higher the inflammatory score, the chances of culture positivity and chances of microbiology positivity was very much higher. It was almost 50% of the patients with more than 20 had culture positivity when compared to 30% if the uh, patients had lower inflammatory score. And most of the organisms in the higher inflammatory score group were gram-negative bacilli. And this is already discussed that including newer molecular techniques will help us get a better yield and better microbiology positivity. It doubles our uh, culture, uh, doubles our uh, chances of getting a microbiology positivity. And what we found out was that gram positive organisms are still very much susceptible to vancomycin, whereas uh, gram negative organisms, what we found out was uh, septazidim and imipenem were comparable. And uh, we found out that cholestine is a better drug in treating gram-negative bacilli organisms. And additional intervention chances were much higher with vitrectomy and silicon oil usage when the inflammatory score was more than 20. And uh, the patients with inflammatory score more than 20 had a poorer visual acuity gain at the end of the, uh, our three-month uh, study. So the take-home message is whenever the inflammatory score is higher, it, the patients presented much earlier they presented with poor visual acuity, the chances of uh, getting a culture positivity is much higher, the chances of getting gram-negative bacilli is much higher, the chances of having additional intervention with the uh, vitrectomy and silicon oil usage is much higher. And, uh, uh, and another insight that it gave us that including newer molecular techniques like PCR and NGS can double your chances of getting microbiology positivity. And uh, these patients with the poorer, uh, 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 higher inflammatory score did much worse than uh, the other patients. So by this we can come to know that inflammatory score is a very novel technique or very novel uh, quantifying agent to prognosticate our patients in endophthalmitis post cataract surgery. So this is our team from uh, LVPI who worked in the endophthalmitis management study and uh, thanks uh, VRSA for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Akash, uh, for presenting that paper. So this paper introduces a different thought as against uh, the EVS, where the EVS uh, classified or uh, split the interventions based on presenting vision. So here uh, we are attempting to do it on uh, the quantum of inflammation, on the concept that infection and inflammation are possibly hand in hand. So if you are having a higher inflammatory score, you're likely to have a greater quantum of infection. So Dr. Guha, you want to make so, a point? And then we'll come to Dr. So, uh... Congratulations because we needed our own country study and kudos to Das and his team. And I'm pleased about the fact that all over these years since the EVS report came out and of the ACRS, that we all of us in general started developing a lower threshold for an earlier victim. And I'm glad that you have kept the score at 10. So which indicates the propensity and which will answer most of Dr. Gilbert's question earlier but I'm still in, uh, want to ask you one or two points. Uh, in the silicon oil field eyes, uh, the uh, <clears throat> situation of injecting intravitreal antibiotics, uh, you reduce the dose, but you can get away sometimes by using one tenth of a dose. I mean, there is no prescribed rule, but uh, you have to inject an antifungal drugs in injection in silicon oil field eyes because those cause retinal toxicity. The toxicity concerns are much more than antibacterial. So post-op end of thalmitis post cataract is predominantly bacterial. Uh, we had only uh, maybe in this four cases which had fungal end of thalmitis. So the chances of injecting antifungal in those chances are very less in our study. We did not have any such instance. Agreed, sir. Organisms, I thought we could have correlated it with the time or onset of the symptoms and presentation. Because any any organism will take some time to create havoc. So and that inflammatory score will, of course, increase. 
and was it in any way related to addition of intravitreal steroids so in our uh, study what we found out was uh, higher the inflammatory score they presented with the symptoms much earlier much earlier yes it was five more more why so more than 20 the inflammation they presented at 5 days the symptoms occurred 5 days from surgery compared to 8 to 9 days when the inflammatory score was less than 20 will this be equally applicable in case of fungal end of the mat you need to have a well, no no there is, there is a reason i am saying in post op cataract post cataract or post intravitreal injections if if you suspect fungal this inflammatory score may not be so in the, uh, well indicative as in bacterial inactivities however it would be of great value in case which dr giridhar showed where you have a clear cut wound and you can uh, identify the entry site actually the clinical suspicion of uh, fungal endophthalmitis the threshold is much higher the uh, we don't identify fungal endophthalmitis as as well as the, the many of the many of the time these uh, back suspected bacterial endophthalmitis turn to be a fungal endophthalmitis at a later point of time which you, you realize much later so i was wondering again he has the same question would the inflammatory score help in identifying the fungal endophthalmitis we have have a published paper already that uh, says that um, many of the so called traditional culture negative endophthalmitis are either polymicrobial or actually fungal so now in a paper that thing publishing not in this five minutes you can't include everything that has got unfortunately this data of uh, 168 175 doesn't have many of fungal infection but when we complete the data of 436 450 we might get a substantial number to to have a get an evidence but the culture negative is not necessarily microbiology negative uh, and that way data were correlating right now i have not yet finalized the data just uh, an addition if i can say that in all those cases they are not coming to you directly or being referred to you at a later stage if your anti segment surgeon has treated that patient with steroid increasing dose of steroid responded stop then recurred please suspect first fungal The delayed bacterial part is less. Yes, we have also pointed out the acne and fungal. The acne and fungal hard to make out. The best protein is. So what we included was acute post-op end of within less than six weeks. So the other the another problem is that when you say culture negative, you've actually made it uh, microbiological positive because you used the PCR techniques. So now when you have a problem when the PCR you know is not 100% because there's always a problem of contamination we have these words kytomes and shytomes and all the stuff where we have uh, problems with uh, a clinical picture which is say, as for example immediate post op you have a pcr positive for fungus but bacterial negative no, and no, 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 let me interrupt um, yeah we did not do a pcr alone we did a pcr sangers and ngs pcr does on e bacteria and pan fungi but as sanger will give the actual actually so i'm glad sir you put that point out because yes. pcr is actually causing a lot of uh, yeah. miscommunication so, and then so, when you go to ngs is further identify yes. ngs is difficult expensive but that we are doing that's the problem sir. it's a very expensive tool but it's pretty much more uh, useful than your pcr alone uh, a very important question has come from prakar goel here that uh, now knowing that septa is 62% resistant should we change our uh, doctrine from septa to colistin and nimipapen now that's something which i think the expert should answer that you know otherwise standard we use septa septa has become a part of this uh, kit also so can we think of altering the directives now because 62% resistance is quite a lot Sir has already answered you. Now, well, in a published paper, Vivek was the f- first author in that. We published that in 2014 when they had to look five year data by Vivek Prasad. We found imipenem was 100 percent sensitive to all those septa as resistant bugs. But unfortunately, in last 10 years or eight years, things have changed, which we did not know actually. And now it's become colistin. In India, there are four published paper from Bombay, Delhi, and Hyderabad that are colistin images. Now, uh, Giridhar also talked about the colistin images. Colistin is not a new drug, very very old drug, but not often used. That's all it is. Now the antibiotic will keep on changing. Then that we make a change to certain you know, something else tomorrow. So it will keep on changing anyway. Is it very expensive, sir? Colistin? No, not at all. As much as septa jadim is. Okay.
There's one more question that every time, I mean, once you're diagnosed fungal, you injected Ampo and Dexa. So every time you repeat, because every 48 hours, if you want to repeat Ampo, then are you going to inject Dexa also along with? Now that's something which huh? we don't. So let that be carry home message that we, because initially we do first shot. Well, we, when we published that, uh, we did randomized clinical trial published in 1999 BJO, and uh, inadvertently those who are fungal, because they did not are fungal, were injected with vancomycin, and uh, Ajit Babu is here, he's the one who published the data that 50% uh, of times he might escape. But if you know it is a fungus, I would not recommend to give you any kind of a steroid with a topical, intravitreal, uh, oral, or systemic, etc., etc. Sometimes it might escape, but most times it will not. But it's important that if you are using inject Moriconazole, prepare to inject again and again. If you are mixing like Avinash told, that septagit, sorry, Moriconazole and B might be escaped. But if you are injecting again, Amphotracin B give a lesser dose than a, than a higher dose. How would the presentation differ in a polymicrobial thing? There is a, there is a reason. I am treating it as bacteria and Avinash said that there can be no, polymicrobial anand may not be not necessarily bacteria and fungi. It could be bacteria and bacteria yeah. also, right? Yeah. You know, but ES, ESCRS, 5 percent patients who are polymicrobial, all are bacteria and bacteria, no fungi at all. No, I'm just trying to find out when should a referring person or treating person suspect that, that polymicrobial has a fungal element in it? No, uh, well, well uh, without... Um, uh, suspect. We have given the task to actually Akash to find out. <laughs> He's working on the data. No, Agash, Avinash, just one last point uh, which comes to my mind. Uh, he mentioned, Avinash mentioned he is not here, but maybe you can answer on his behalf. Uh, he said amphotericin B is the preferred drug of choice over voriconazole. True, accepted. But to offset that point would be other issues raised by another school of thought regarding the higher toxicity. May not be the lipophilic. Uh, amphotericin B still can get away, but the toxicity of issues of amphotericin B, because if it's repeated, if it's no, repeated. Repeat, repeat, don't repeat the entire dose, you repeat 10 microgram, give and give 5 or give 2.5 microgram like that, then you can most probably escape. But fungus are very notorious, it's not easy. Is the candida and aspergillus, candida is little better than aspergillus, aspergillus fujarium are worse compared to uh, East like candida. In case of the polymicrobial infection, I think it would be easier if you don't see the response so soon, you probably have to re-sample it again. So resampling yeah. probably will increase the yield. True, but then, uh, but, then, but then uh, if the patient is clinically doing well, despite what well, microbiology yeah. say, please don't change yeah. because yeah. microbiology is in well. vitro, not in vivo. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not when it's doing well. Yeah. Doing well Even not doing well. Agash, one other point which comes. In a case of proven, I'm referring, referring to endogenous endothelitis. In a case of proven fungemia, we have to also establish a protocol for fungal, fungus screening to catch the earliest case, cases. Because there are two schools of thought there again. Uh, there is uh, one observation I would like to carry forward is that whenever vitrectomy is done in these difficult cases, I think it should be a little senior surgeon or experienced surgeon doing it. Uh, then, you know, mostly I've seen it's been given to a trainee. And for a trainee to really do a good job of vitrectomy in an infected eye is difficult. So I think that carry on message I would like to pass on. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't agree with that because the younger guys are smarter guys than the older guys. And then, then. <laughs> <laughs> Barack Obama was smarter than the current presidents of uh, Michael's country. <laughs> so. Uh, I said that if you have enough confidence in yourself, so most of, most of the time medical uh, doctor is one who knows when to stop, not when to start. If you know when to stop, then you will stop it and take the help of somebody else. Don't be adventurous. Don't, they, like I told, they don't, like he told, treat the patient, not the disease. Then you will be fine. I'm very happy that uh, the anathematis is not a very, very, very favorite topic or not very exciting topic. Last session I hall was... I was standing actually this time, at least I'm standing. But many years ago, I was giving a presentation somewhere under the Mitis, and uh, I was asked that, uh, what is that disease? So that disease happened to people who operate. <laughs> <laughs>
mention the role of intravenous in the fungicide doxorubicin? Systemic, yes. Uh, si any systemic, whatever you want to give. So, Vivek, would you agree that if uh, you were very clear about the fact that there's no question of core vitrectomy? I mean, at the end of your talk. No, no, I agree. I, I know, I know. No sacrosite but, rule, but I yeah, follow yeah. that. But I would, would you like agree if you have a possible. fresh post-operative endophthalmitis or polytrauma endophthalmitis with an RD in situ, would you then try to do a full vitrectomy and do a full job just as you do in any other case? If, the, of course, the view is compromised, everything is bad. Would there be a, just a role for a biopsy, vitreous biopsy, and then you, then you reconsider at a second stage? My, my only indication for not doing a full job is if the patient becomes uncooperative or it's a general anesthesia and we are not able to give and, you know, there is a compromise situation where we need to do something. Yeah. But otherwise, I would, uh, I think, prefer yeah, I, to I would do agree to do a full vitrectomy yeah, yeah. as far as possible. Okay. So, okay. thank you. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, uh, the speakers, the panel. And thank you, the audience, for, uh, you know, hanging around for the last session of the last day. If I can now uh, request all speakers and panel uh, to come together for a group photograph, please.